Hi, I'm Miranda Cosgrove, and this is Mission Unstoppable. Strap in, we're riding roller coasters for science. The centrifugal force is the force that you feel. Then, bismuth isn't just a city in South Dakota. It's the subject of this rocking lab. My favorite are these little towers. I mean, so cool. And learn how one engineer is making our world more reliable. And as a reliability engineer, I help to maintain equipment and ensure that it's performing the function that it's intended to perform. Then, meet a scientist putting people's cells on microchips. If you can get the human cells on here to behave more like a human, then you can understand how the human body is going to respond. Get ready to meet the scientists, inventors, and heroes who help make our world a better place. The future is here. The mission, unstoppable. To make a roller coaster, you gotta know how to make things roll, how to make things coast, and probably like a hundred other things. We sent Fig to meet an engineer who could tell us more. Think of your favorite ride at a theme park. The rush of the wind, the adrenaline as you speed up, your friends laughing as you whip through curves. Well, you can thank physics for those thrills. And while you're at it, thank an engineer, like Bush Gardens Vice President of Design and Engineering, Susie Cheely. She's been designing and building coasters since 1993. Before I came here, I worked as a structural engineer. I was designing buildings and bridges, and I had the opportunity to work at a theme park, and I thought, how fun could that be? Today, Susie and I are meeting virtually to talk about some of the science that went into creating her wooden coaster, the Invader, which I recently had the pleasure of riding sitting right beside her. And it all started with a climb to the top of a 74-foot drop. The way you get the train up to the top of the hill is on the lift. Now, on Invader, we do it with a chain. Ah, yes. That anticipatory climb up a hill is a staple of coasters around the world because it creates the perfect scientific conditions for a dramatic drop. Basically, you have a force that takes the roller coaster car and the people that are in it up to the top of a hill, and that's where your potential energy is the greatest. At the top of the lift, there's nothing to push the cars down the plunge except gravity, which is exactly what turns the coaster's potential energy into kinetic action. Once you start going downhill, that's when the kinetic energy takes over and carries the train all the way back to the station. So that one lift built up enough potential energy to take us around the whole ride? It absolutely did. That's over 2,000 feet of track, powered solely by gravity. But gravity is not the only force riders can feel on the invader. Take these curves. This coaster can move fast up to speeds of 50 miles per hour. If a car tried to make these turns at that speed on the road, it would spin right off the street. But here, center-seeking forces keep the coaster on track, literally. There are two different kind of forces to talk about here. It's centripetal and centrifugal. Can you tell me the difference between the two? The centrifugal force is the force that you feel as the passenger or the coaster car feels. You're holding on and you almost feel like you're being pulled to one side or the other. So another example would be if you had, say, a ball on the end of a string, like a tennis ball, and you just started swinging it around, okay? The force that's actually felt by the tennis ball itself would be centrifugal force. The force and the string that is actually keeping it in that curved path, that would be the centripetal force. Just like a tennis ball being swung on a string, the centrifugal force is the force pulling on the car and passengers as it goes around a curve. And the centripetal force is like the string, which keeps the car in place. So the track and the roller coaster itself is keeping us in place while we're going around the loops. That's right. As the engineer behind the coaster, Susie has to balance these physical forces with construction safety, all while calculating how to get as many thrill-inducing moments into a two-minute ride. 
There are so many different forces and factors to consider when taking a ride on a roller coaster. There really are, but we don't want our guests to have to think about that. We want, just want them to have fun, right? <laughs> I offer my services as a roller coaster tester. So anytime you need someone to come out and go on a roller coaster, you know who to call. I will call you next time for sure. All right, I'll be waiting by the phone. <laughs>
To find out more, today we're talking to mechanical engineer Erica Anderson, reliability lead at a major oil refinery. As a reliability engineer, I help to maintain equipment and ensure that it's performing the function that it's intended to perform. My entire job is about problem solving. When I deal with equipment, the equipment can fail. And for me, it's all about finding what is the root cause of failure and how can I restore it? Or if I have a design, how can I improve my design? How can I make it better so I'm getting better performance out of it? Today, Erica is going to give us a crash course on reliability engineering by building the first ever mission unstoppable car out of cardboard and like straws. Look, knowledge is free, but sports cars are expensive. So reliability is based on three key principles, design it right, operate it right, and maintain it right. Here, we're in the design phase. And it's important that as we're designing it, we make sure that we're putting the right materials together and we assemble them correctly so that my car is gonna perform the way that I want it to. Using a piece of cardboard as the body of the car, Erica uses straws and barbecue skewers as axles, water bottle caps and pieces of sponge as wheels, and a little DIY knowledge to put it all together. Once she knows the wheels all work, she adds the power. Rubber bands store elastic potential energy. The more I deform this rubber band, the more energy that I'm storing. So the further back I go, that is more and more energy. We're gonna be winding up this rubber band around the back axle and storing more and more potential energy that gets transferred to kinetic energy through the axle to the wheels, and this is what's gonna accelerate our car forward. After adding some super cool racing stripes, it's time to head to the test track. This is where design and operation come together. For it to perform reliably, our design has to be right, but we also have to operate it right. Let's see how it goes. That wasn't exactly the reliable performance that we were looking for. So as an engineer, I don't see this as failure. I see this as an opportunity for us to improve. With results from our first test, Erica heads back to try again. We test it, and if it doesn't perform to our standards, we take it back to the drawing board. Instead of using bottle caps on my back wheels, I'm thinking CDs may be a little heavier and it give us the traction that we need. Using a larger diameter tire, we can get the car to go further. Not only that, the CDs weigh more than the water bottle caps, so that weight should help it not spin out like we saw the first time. Let's see how it goes. A little more reliable than our last one. We did get it to travel some distance, but it didn't stay in a linear path. Looks like we got another opportunity to improve our design. The CDs definitely helped it to go further, so I'm thinking, what if we were to try to change out the front axles and use CDs there too? After attaching the new front wheels, Erica's ready to put the car to the test. Now that is what good reliability looks like. Not only did it go a good distance, but it did so in a linear path. This is because we designed it right and we operated right. The last aspect of good reliability is your maintenance. If we wanna ensure this car is gonna to continue to perform, we're gonna to have to maintain it. So certain parts of it, such as your car body, the tape, the glue, even the rubber band, are gonna be subject to wear and tear and fatigue over time, and we'll need to replace them if we wanna to continue to get that kind of performance out of it. So, from a simple car made of household materials to the giant pieces of equipment that I work with every single day, reliability is so important. If you design it right, you operate it right, and you maintain it right, then you're gonna get the continued performance that we desire. And that is something you can rely on. Nachos teach us that everything is better on a chip. And it's crazy how far that metaphor goes. Erica can tell us more. Imagine it's the year 3000 and you can integrate parts of your body into a microchip to study it. You could literally plug a piece of yourself into a microfluidic chip and run tests on it. Well, buckle up and strap in because Dr. Elizabeth Wheeler is working towards just that. When I was in junior high school, I had the opportunity to go to a conference to introduce girls to different math and science fields. 
and kind of fell in love with a lot of science then. Chemical engineering was really because I couldn't make a decision, right? I loved all the different fields, math, science, chemistry, couldn't decide, threw them together, and came up with this, this field that allows me to do anything. And it all led her here, to this new science. Elizabeth is taking human tissue systems, like the brain and the heart, and putting them on a microchip. Then doctors will be able to monitor how the human body responds to different medicines that are being developed. If we understand how the human body responds, we can come up with ways to protect it better and to help people. For example, let's say you're allergic to dogs, which would be terrible. Someday your organs can be put on a chip to find out the best cure for you. Speaking of animals, this science could possibly eliminate animal testing forever. If you can get the human cells on here to behave more like a human, then you can understand how the human body's gonna respond. That's the ultimate goal, right? If you think about it, they do a lot of testing on, on mice and rodents, and then they'll pass the testing with those, but then when they get to humans, you get different side effects because we are slightly different from mice and rats. I guess we are slightly different from mice, even though I love cheese. How exactly is this made? What it is, it's a glass slide that we've patterned with metal so that we use the metal to conduct the electricity so we can understand what the cells are doing and monitor them and then we can expose this to different uh, chemicals and, or pharmaceuticals and medicines to see how the brain responds. The samples they're studying now are simple groupings of cells atop a flat slide. But Elizabeth and her team are working toward creating and testing three-dimensional tissue structures that more closely mimic our own organs through a process called bioprinting. Basically, this device in your hand, we've zoomed in to the very center of it. So these are our electrodes. This is how we listen in to what the cells are saying. So the electrodes are made out of metal, and then we have these connectors that allow us to connect up to the wires and get the signals out of the chip. How does this glass slide thingy simulate my body? So if you've ever been to the doctor and they've done an EKG, right, they put the electrodes on it and they measure the electrical activity of your heart. So these electrodes allow us to measure the contraction of the heart cells as well. So we can hear the heart contracting like you would at the doctor's office. You can kind of see they twitch, they contract. And by looking at these electrodes, when they contract, liquid leaks through to the electrodes so we can measure a change. So then we can kind of uh, get the beating of the heart. Ooh, this is very cool. So bioprinting gives us that spatial control to put things in really discrete locations and know we have the organ how we want it to be put together. So we're controlling the architecture. Yeah, that's the power of what we're doing. Wow. Thanks to Dr. Wheeler for this life-saving and groundbreaking science. If you put my brain on a chip right now, it would be like, this is crazy. Welcome back. Before we go, we have one last thing. Every day is different. There's a lot of surprises, and every project you learn something on, and that's one of the great things about it. You just you learn something new every day, and um, who could ask for more? With one little internet search, there's so much information out there. Soak it all up. You never know what you like until you actually try it. So I encourage you to try different fields, and you may find some you don't like, and that's perfectly okay. You're gonna find some that you like, and maybe even some that you love. Pursue your passions. I think in science especially, it's important that everyone comes and brings their different viewpoints, because that's how you solve different problems. The sum is greater than the parts. That's it for Mission Unstoppable. Next week, we're answering the age-old question, how do you throw a party in space? You plan it. Bye. If you're watching this, you must have really liked the video. Make sure you follow and subscribe and check out these other videos that are even better. No, really, I've seen this one over a hundred times.